Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Alvaro Hodge and I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm joined by my friends Giselle Donnelly. I'm also a senior fellow at AEI and Julia Zoja with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington University. On our podcast, we talk about the challenges to European peace and security that have erupted along a line running from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. Our special guest today is Wojciech Przybioski, Editor-in-Chief of Visegrad Insight, President of Respublika Foundation, a Polish think tank and fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, Austria, which is great to have you here. And if our listeners enjoy this episode, they should consider subscribing, rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever they get their podcasts. Which is, again, great to have you. So you you publish a magazine called Visegrad Insight. And even in the years before the war, uh, there was a lot of sort of awkwardness around that, um, particularly in those four Central European countries concerned, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and, and Slovakia. I remember having conversations with, with you know, Slovaks who very willingly joined the Eurozone, about whether we want to be associated with the Poles and Hungarians who were at the time seen as troublemakers in the EU. Obviously, the Czechs live in a sort of bubble of their own when it comes to, to these things uh, and, and, and have a sort of their own sense of, of exceptionalism. Uh, how uh, relevant is still this, this, this sort of frame of reference for understanding the region? Uh, and how has that understanding changed as a result of, of Russia's war against Ukraine? Let's start in by, by saying how, how uh, I'm happy I am to have this conversation uh, with you, Dalibor, Yulia, and Giselle. Uh, that's, uh, that's really uh, an interesting moment to discuss uh, Central Europe, as we are reading in, in many uh, many places that there is some center of gravity moving east, and, you know, the... the People try to put names to to the to the facts on on the ground, and I think oftentimes this is getting misplaced. So also this is happening with Visegrad. Uh, Visegrad group uh, um, exists for already 30, well, more than thirty years, and it started um, with this very uh, strange name for uh, English speaker, uh, which basically means uh, uh, a castle or uh, yeah, well, a mansion, a castle on the hill. And it's um, and it's a typical location uh, across many countries in Central Europe from medieval times. The name uh, resonates, indeed, a medieval ambition of the countries in Central Europe to be connected north and south among each other in terms of defense, transportation, economy, and there is a and for a number of centuries there have been uh, uh, an obvious obstacle. Uh, um, quite beautiful, but difficult to, to cross mountains. Um, Carpathian mount- mountains across it horizontally, especially Tatra mountains that disconnect Poland and, and the rest of, of, the, of the countries, exposing it, uh, geopolitically speaking, to, uh, to much stronger influences of both East and West. So these countries already in 14th century have been formulating this kind of kingdoms alliance of, of that uh, of that time um, to uh, actually support and reinforce uh, one another and also tune down the tensions that were between individual kingdoms you know who stole monies to of, of whose and, and you know what, whatever trade imbalances they could have seen that of course has happened also uh, at these times so in the in the 90s where these countries went out of, of the communist period they set up a uh, um, a declaration that if you read it and hardly anyone reads it today makes perfect sense it's all about um, European integration building connectivity among each other respecting minority rights respecting um, the uh, the national heritage at the same time the culture but uh, looking forward and it's a forward-looking project for for building uh, the western leg of of, uh, of this region connecting it to NATO, and that was the first uh, reason of, of uh, formulating this uh, proposal to have the group. And, and later on, after NATO uh, accession was, was complete, that was, that was the euro 
uh, European Union uh, integration that for Slovakia in particular meant uh, a package and in Slovak case meant that the neighbors were giving a ha- helping hand in the past during authoritarian period to the country that otherwise wasn't so democratic and I'll and I'll now fast uh, jump into into the future and in the past today we have heard mostly and people recognize today Visegrad through the through the perception of Mr. Orban and Mr. Kaczynski, uh, who have been very vocal for the past, say, eight years about, about Visegrad. Uh, and, uh, and they've been abusing it. They've been treating it partly as their domestic uh, uh, agenda and foreign policy. Um, they've created a bit of a monstrum. Uh, so Visegrad that we just spoke about is nearly dead because uh, everyone who is committed to the values of the liberal um, and democracy uh, founded, uh, democratically founded cooperation is basically uh, estranged uh, by by the proposals put forward by Mr. Orban Kaczynski. And the good news is uh, that they are unable to cooperate anymore and the Visegrad again will will rebuild and rekindle uh, without them la- later on. Uh, they, they cannot work anymore because they're on fundamental uh, grounds, they, they're disconnected. Um, and, and where Visegrad will prove uh, successful over and over again, I believe, is again on the European Union turf uh, as a as a one of many forms of consultation and coordination and some European initiatives, because without the EU, frankly speaking, the format would not survive either. Delabor and I um, are nostalgic for the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, so perhaps that can be a model for reviving Eastern and Central European cooperation. Um, But I want to ask you briefly about Poland, which is, you know, from an American perspective, been a little bit hard to decode uh, over the last several years. Uh, Prior to the Ukraine war, so much of the focus was on, uh, you know, Duda and the nationalistic impulse that he reflects. um, And it's rather the un unpleasant facets of that. But obviously, since uh, since the war began, Poland has absolutely been stalwart in uh, taking in refugees, supplying weaponry, uh, providing uh, access for U.S. supplies. You know, the United States just recently advanced a new plan to expand its military posture in Poland. I wonder if you could just share with our listeners how you put all this together in a, you know, how should Americans understand uh, Poland as it is now and where it's headed? Uh, well, that's a question we are asking ourselves, you know, in Poland. Uh, we, we've got a couple of surprises for for, um, for ourselves as well. Uh, one of the surprises was the, the big solidarity moment again for refugees uh, and, and the numbers that were welcomed uh, were overwhelming, not just in terms of, strictly speaking, arithmetics and the capacity of the country, but in terms of, well, the, the welcoming uh, they, they have received. Um, and that's uh, that's a story that, uh, well, that... that ch- change also self-perception of Poles, of, of, of how, um, how we can do things uh, together. And especially here, we need to be thankful to, to people who engage on the borders, in the reception centers. There was a lot of volunteering. But beyond that, there was an, a, a tremendous effort of, of three important actors that we may uh, usually lose uh, uh, sight of from, from the general picture. This was local governments um, that that they were fully committed. They're continuously committed to to welcoming and receiving uh, Ukrainians and accommodating them in the spaces they are, they are uh, available, um, but primarily providing schooling and uh, and healthcare um, to to the people in need. Secondly, these were businessmen. And I do not mean here donation-driven uh, charity, but there were business organizations, one of the biggest and most successful Polish logistic companies that uh, enabled um, their centers, logistical centers at the, at the border for reception. There was 
another guy in uh, one of the champions of the digital i mean he's basically competing for in this packaging uh, services uh, very native innovative across uh, uh, europe already uh, that is Brzoska. he organized a transport of some 40 cargo train con- uh, containers to the to the east of, of ukraine you have had um, uh, IT sector uh, involved in uh, providing services for free to, uh, you know, to 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 enable this logistical operation. Essentially, it was it was massive, and that's that's the second story that that still remains untold. It remains fascinating, in, in my opinion. And and the last but not least, um, people uh, just you know people who open their homes, and it's you know it's. I also had uh, Svetlana from around uh, Kiev. We just went to the train station and and we offered her uh, one one spare bed that we had, and and she stayed with us. And I have to admit, it was a stretch. And for many people, just having three months uh, period with with people who whom they accommodated, that, that was a stretch. And I think I mean nothing to applaud me, but but people took whole families, uh, you know, to 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 live with them and. Given given these circumstances, um, the, that was that that is remarkable. So I think in the in the in the uh, you know in this in this story, what is what is remarkable is is th- this general goodness in, in in people that has revealed itself, and that has uh, remade uh, the politics of, of Poland, which otherwise, uh, as you said, as you just described, was was absolutely ugly, nationalistic, and and under you know undercutting uh, the, the the very kind of the, the, the success story and the foundations of of what what Poland also has been bef- uh, before, mm. and if you want, I can I can explain the the dynamics how it how it has shaped uh, the Polish politics, but yeah. And, and Wojciech, be, before you go on, maybe you can also. Um help us make sense of not just how this has impacted politics within Poland. I think this is one of the important elements that we're looking for and trying to understand and explain here on the other side of the Atlantic, but also how you see that impacting Poland-EU relations. Um, Because on the one hand, we've had Poland put into the category of democratic backsliding, should be getting sanctions from the EU, um, look at all, all the shortcomings um, when it comes to civil society, etc. But on the other hand, and I don't know to what extent this has been successful, the government for good or bad, has argued, but look at what we're doing and how much we're helping Ukraine. And um, that is a very smart populist argument to make, but, you know, one that that is rooted in reality, um, because Poland has been, just like you were saying, doing something that we've never seen before, right, Um, in any country, in any circumstance, in any conflict, and so at least our generation. And so, Mm -hmm. Can you help us make sense of that, how it's impacting on one side domestic politics and on the other side the relations with the EU? Yeah, uh, great questions. And, and that I have, I'm happy to address. Um, let's, let's now remember uh, what just happened two months before uh, the invasion, the, new, the renewed invasion, uh, so the mass scale attack on the 24th, February 2022. In December, um, a year back, so just okay, over over two months uh, earlier, Warsaw hosted uh, the biggest European rally of political parties, which are widely or have been widely considered as Putin's proxies. So the ruling government in Poland in December uh, was was basically building a pan-European platform to accommodate uh, some of the some of the people now they would they would be you know never invited again to, to Warsaw but that that was a per- particular moment and i think that was the probably the peak of what the pis government could have achieved in terms of uh, building their position um, within these parties in, in, in the past and secondly, there was another moment in which uh, President Duda, 
um, otherwise um, uh, very very engaged in the in in shaking hands with with Donald Trump and not giving a phone call to John Biden after he he was elected, he made this a very important move. He comes from the very government that had this strategy, but when it came to the uh, media freedom and particularly uh, um, a new legal act that the parliament and the government voted for, he vetoed that on the grounds of uh, not allowing a takeover of the gov- by the government of the private media sector, including the American-owned, um, uh, so this is Warner Brothers Discovery um, Enterprise by now, uh, Tefal and uh, private TV station. And that put him at odds um, and presidents in Poland are not as weak as in many other European countries, but they are definitely not as strong as in France, not let, let alone uh, U.S. presidents. It's it's more, they're they are somewhere in between. So he exposes himself in order to uh, uh, already in December, already listening to to what the uh, the dangers uh, are being announced or kind of um, at the. Um, uh, the intelligence community in the U.S. and the U.K. is is already providing as a potential uh, geopolitical moment. So the Russia would would use uh, again the card uh, of, uh, of 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 their uh, aggressive posture, and um, and he sees this as um, as a necessary step also to prevent uh, a full uh, conf- a moment in which the the fundamentals of the transatlantic relations that Poland is so heavily uh, attached to. We're speaking of the most pro-American country in Europe and the European Union. Oh, I mean, probably by now, um, Ukraine is is in competition, but, uh, but, uh, but, but you know, but he, he, he goes with the people also. He's a popular, ele- popularly elected uh, politician and he goes with the people ahead of the ahead of that uh, time where people didn't want uh, this kind of direction. Now, when when uh, the invasion started, what we have seen is in parallel, Poland and Polish government quickly realized that with the numbers of Polish citizens, supportive and receiving Ukrainians, with no other strategy that they have been, would have been credible and pursuing, they just need to um, adapt in terms of opening doors, uh, giving out uh, access to public services and uh, and essentially liberalizing uh, legislation. So Ukrainian citizens would enter European Union through the Polish border freely. They would uh, receive, moreover, the registration numbers, giving them access to the public administration services, um, which Ukrainians, I have to tell, were complaining that we're so backward because they used the Estonian um, uh, digital toolbox already for a number of years uh, in employing and then reforming their own um, administration. And um, and and what it really did was uh, to facilitate and to provide arms and um, and logistics uh, to Ukraine. So where it it made a difference, and that was the second uh, political decision that was so important, is that the government actually uh, stood up to the challenge, with president also being the supreme uh, leader more formally than than in, unless there is a unless Poland is at war, um, then not. He, he's, um, but he also supports the nominations. And it, it was in a coordinated effort in which opposition also fully supported the government's uh, position. And Poland did step in when, where it mattered um, in, uh, in deliveries of, of the equipment, in facilitating also a lot of the equipment deliveries uh, to, to Ukraine, and not to mention also aid and, and so on and so forth the international systems. At the same time, as we spoke about Visegrad, uh, Mr. Orban has had been, has, ha- has had a campaign, political uh, parliamentary campaign, in which he decided uh, to do what he was always doing. Um, he, ex- he would exploit um, the, mm, the sentiment of Hungarians of, of feeling betrayed by the world order 
uh, unlike Poles, we have to say that Poles are in their happiest moment in the in their long their long history in terms of the world order and their place on the map. So Hungarians are not so happy about where they are. They feel like they should have been bigger because they used to and but but they chose the bad alliances let's let's skip history here now for, but 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 Viktor Orban is basically exploiting this this uh, this more of a cynical uh, approach to to international relations on Hungarian and say i i am for peace let them stop you know i don't want i don't want the war and and by the way he gives an interview in march so just i think it's 2 weeks after the invasion that resonates big time in Poland, in which he says that for him, Ukraine is just a place on the map. It, it doesn't, you know, it's a, it's a buffer zone. He doesn't care for what it will be called. It's, well, not even a border dispute. He doesn't recognize the statehood of his neighbor with whom, with whom, uh, you, you know, Hungary has had bigger trade relations uh, in, nominal t- uh, in nominal terms in the sense of a volume uh, than, than with Russia before the war. And that infuriates um, uh, uh, Polish leadership. They, um, they were the first to travel to Kiev uh, along the side of Prime Minister Fiala, Petr Fiala, who assumed, assumed a, 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 temp, a half-year-long uh, EU presidency as a Czech um, uh, leader. And, and the idea apparently came from from uh, uh, Mr. Janša, who was the Prime Minister of Slovenia, also previously at odds, let's say, on he, he's been on the margins, of, on the far right margins of the um, of the conservative movement in uh, in Europe, and they three bundle uh, together in 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 a, in a wagon and make this extraordinary trip. That was the first trip, also to be remembered as they put uh, put their feet on the ground and they put a geographical distance between themselves and Mr. Orban in terms of political strategy. That was three weeks into the full-scale invasion, right? Still full-on battle of Kiev, yeah. That was the moment when most of the embassies were already gone from Kiev. There was... Uh, mm, quite brave decision. I think it was only of, Poland that was exactly, standing. Exactly, of the ambassador... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, uh, Polish ambassador who who decided to stay, and it's, it's that that will also go uh, well in, in history books. And Polish government loves history, by the way. I mean, they're all talking about history rather than the future. But uh, but they they made the right call. They, they, All of Central and Eastern Europe loves history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, overall, that that's the dynamics that has shaped that has been um, uh, shaping. And and maybe last thing, the reasoning there is much deeper. I, I I touched upon it, but I I do not mean just to joke about it. Poland's positions uh, for the past hundred years is is enabled only by the international order by unfortunate outcomes of the First World War and the thirteenth point of the Wilson Plan. And for Europe, it it re, it rests on its independence and builds back uh, from you know it it, it disappeared on, uh, from a map for many, which we all know, regardless of the political colors in Poland, because there is some sense of uh, moral guidance and agreement that shaped the international order, and of course it comes with a, a lot of not just degree, a lot of realism. While Hungarians uh, believe only in 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 real politik and, and realism, and they absolutely do not think that the current world order uh, is something they are satisfied with. So um, to shift the conversation a little bit in beyond, well, geopolitics regionally, but um, adding one more ingredient to the story that is obviously of great importance here um, in Washington, but is increasingly, whether Europeans like it or not, also of um, increasing importance in in Europe, and that's China, right? We've seen Xi traveling to uh, Moscow. We've seen a lot of interpretations thereof. We now see European leaders um, traveling to Beijing, and when we're looking into the Visegrad countries, that's a mixed bag, to say the least. Um, 
uh, over the last few days, we've seen the largest ever Czech delegation um, flying to Taiwan. Uh, Hungary next door is an old and very loyal friend of the Chinese Communist Party. And um, when we're looking into in Poland as well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. So um, I'm wondering if you can give us uh, an overview of where you see regional Central European countries positioning themselves when it comes to China's increasing role in the conflict and in the region. And if you can also give us a glimpse into Polish politics when it comes to China. I think that these are the key questions uh, for for the future. And uh, the Polish political elite overall, both the government and, and the opposition, so far have been keeping um i wouldn't say traditional but but uh but the position that we have heard uh for many years over the past decades which is poland has had some legacy diplomatic relations that oftentimes were useful um to uh, to the us to uh but not only um when nixon was uh, shaping the the relationship with with china he did it through the um chinese embassy in poland um it, it there was some utility in diplomatic terms of of uh, having those grounds uh, for diplomacy in poland we have had uh, during donald trump's presidency and netanyahu's uh, previous term a conference on iran that uh, were both essentially organized by U.S. and Israeli side and hosted by Poland, which has very good relations with uh, U.S. It actually has also very good relations, has had very good relations with Iran. They still continue. The reason being uh, is that Iranians and then Persia accepted during the Second World War uh, a huge number of uh, refugees, Polish refugees from the Soviet Union. So, these are particular flavors and peculiarities that I think we we should remember, but we can put slowly aside um, because the the tensions that we have, uh, are seeing would demand something of a more bold in action. Political class during the electoral uh, campaign is is not prepared for that, and I think you can uh, understand very well that uh, you, you don't win an election on, on foreign policy. Um, but there are interesting um, moments in, in which uh, the political class in Poland might, might actually look ahead and catch up with the people again. Uh, by summer, we'll be releasing new study showing that actually, when it comes to different fears and threat perception, in Poland, vis-a-vis -vis other countries, China is much stronger. It's about 30% of uh, different uh, of of the population in Poland perceiving China as a as a threat as a identity threat even because uh, of 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 their growing role in the in the global affairs again that might be linked to how Poland uh, relies on the on the US uh, overall and how closely it is tied historically again and culturally with um, with the american uh, spirit now uh, for other Central European countries, there were some very interesting developments that Poland may not immediately copy-paste, but should be take, take definitely lessons from. Czech Republic, um, for a number of years, have been recognizing uh, uh, Dalai Lama's effort and the struggle against communism by the minorities. And um, in the past years, it has the political elite and even outside of the main leadership of the country, um, came from 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 a corner and and uh, issued statement that uh, that um, on the municipal level, senate level, but then confirmed also on the government level, um, made it clear where where Czech Republic stands, and it was uh, about the values and democracy first and foremost with a very clear strategy to match interests and values. Czech Republic is producing uh, cars, um, just like Slovakia, uh, and to a large extent like Poland, 
for the German market. And the cars that they've been producing during the pandemic were put on the parking slots without being actually uh, mobile. They were immobilized because of the lack of uh, microchips, microprocessors. Now, uh, the global chain that has of, of, of supplies that has been shattered during the pandemic made Czechs believe and realize that they actually need to think of, of these core uh, uh, values in terms also of their interests, because just I, like I mentioned, Polish a rudimentary sense of security in the global uh, in the in the global place in uh, you know the place in the world and the world affairs. Czechs also realize that their extremely um, successful economic uh, um, uh, prosperity uh, times that they are enjoying is. Um, is strictly attached also to a certain model of the world order that they need to support and sustain. Following the, This was followed also to a certain extent by Slovakia, where they basically also, while linking to supporting Taiwan, they also started to have open diplomatic and economic talks uh, with Taiwan over supply chains, factories, microprocessors, and, and so on. Similarly, Lithuania, a small country in north of Poland, uh, made made such moves. I won't I won't have time probably won't have time to elaborate further. It didn't go as great, but in in the direction and eventually I think um, it 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 paid off uh, for Lithuania to to first emphasize the uh, the uh, the values um, and and to stand by the principles and also to to set these grounds uh, as a, as a new ground for for talking business and talking about uh, interests which are based on that as they are looking for uh, exporting their laser production and technology to Taiwan and they're also looking for uh, other uh, relationship where across uh, both in the southeast asia and um, and with the us but i think there is an interesting moment that poland for the time being is missing but um, I can only tell you that um, I, as I've been just to DC and spent a lot of conversation with also diplomats um, who are, or of, officials who are very close uh, to decision-making circles on Central Europe and Poland, that basically there is, there is an expectation and there is a conversation about uh, this. And I would assume that um, after elections, we're, we're going to see swift changes and and um, more of a um, clear statement on uh, on the question of independence Taiwan and hopefully also human rights because there's some rudimentary basic things that that current Polish government just cannot cannot find empathy for but there are, there are these basic human rights violations that uh, that you need to stand up to um, and and probably you need uh, a different uh, different political class for that. Um, Dalibor, I know you want to talk about the upcoming elections, but I was hoping we could squeeze in one more international take before that. Um, and that's, I'd be interested in Wojtek's take on the Sphinx of, of Europe, uh, meaning Olaf Scholz and Germany in particular. Um, again, just to sort of uh, characterize an American view, it's it's perplexing. Um the Germans have certainly come a long way from where they were 15 months ago, but they've also fallen short, you know, not unlike the Biden administration, uh, of what perhaps necessity demands. I'd just be interested on, uh, you don't have to speak, you know, for all polls or you know, anything like that, but be interested in your, how, how do you think about Germany these days? Well, Germany is has made uh, big promises and particularly Chancellor Olaf Scholz has trouble fulfilling them um, in time. Uh, but uh, as we see d- months after months, they're moving. It's a, it's a, it's a big machinery, this, this German bureaucracy. They're moving in the direction they have promised. So there is a lot of an- anxiety about, first there was anxiety about whether they would make the move they promised now there, there, there were there were various pressures to actually make them um, go in the direction we we really need them to go. And Germany is the biggest uh, economy, and 
and also arms producer uh, that can tilt the balance uh, and and uh, help end this war, uh, help we, Ukraine push uh, the uh, invaders back, you know, to the to the borders, um, and secure them and and secure Ukraine from further attacks and incursions. And I think as Germany has lost a lot of months and opportunities to demonstrate that they are the leaders. Uh, nomin- you know, not just nominally, but but by by principle and by by taking a stance. Uh, Poland is uh, a bit disillusioned, but uh, also desperate in terms of r- our relationship. Like all of Euro- Central Europe, we are our economies are in about forty percent of our trade for each of these country um, uh, in relationship to Germany. Uh, Polish number one uh, trade partner, and increasingly our eco- our economy is and inc- also going up in the ranks in the German economy. We are intertwined to the extent that no one else is. Well, our second biggest partner is Czech Republic, but that's because of our triangle of supplies goes with Germany and uh, Poland. Poland production related to to Czechia. Is also very very linked also to the to the uh, to the economy of, of of Germany. So while we are politically really critical, and that goes all across of uh, of the political class, um, you know, seeing what what uh, Chancellor is is not doing, there is also there is a understanding that we need to craft our strategy in a broader term that, that we haven't been doing b- before. We've built our prosperity on the grounds that German, Germany have been building their prosperity on. Poles were simply um, uh, a step ahead and did what Germans also knew should be done, but they haven't been doing, making this investment for 2, 2% GDP in, uh, in, the, in upgrading our military and, and, and army uh, way ahead. Germany was just saying they would. They they are now in need of of catching up. But the past years, they were free riding the security question um, and benefiting economically. Uh, that uh, that created a lot of dependencies. They have demonstrated they could have cut off quickly from Russia because Nord Stream two, which everybody thought is going to be a huge problem if it stops. It turned out that well that there is a workaround and and there the you know, the supplies so far seems to be promising in terms of upkeeping the current demand. The tr- transformation needs to go on, but the German company's investment in China is so huge. But this is not just German Americans as well that go you know quickly going away from that would mean um, a lot of economic. Uh, uh, hardship that that Germany is is not so uh, simply prepared, and frankly speaking, most of the European economy is not so um, uh, ready to, to to make. So here, Poland, despite its obvious criticism of the um, uh, of the strategic position of of uh, German government, is also careful on the economy side because any any moves. Uh, that are being made and the decisions uh, need to be also considered from our long-term uh, prospects of of growth and upkeeping uh, the the challenges of today uh, which are inflation which are uh, providing homes and then and, and economy for you know, refugees and and actually shifting the gears on the production uh, of, of the ammo and and necessary um, equipment for for ukrainians uh, i'm simplifying things because there's much more to that and probably you you could find ways again i do believe that you can find ways to unpack it and you can you can be much more also creative and ambitious in 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 europe but that's uh, that will take not just polish elections but the upcoming eu elections next year uh, when the new commission or maybe to a large extent similar commission as today uh, will actually take from you know lessons from all these experiences of pandemic response and um, and and uh, and the war in Ukraine 
and we'll shape the new priorities uh, that, that we are currently also uh, trying to plug in as Central Europeans in, in this Grenze. But the shape of these new policies, uh, this is this is uh, this will have to include also relationship to to China, where um, but also it will have to shape the future of investing into competitiveness of European economy, while in in US uh, the uh, the investment uh, around uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act is perceived as undermining the European uh, European chances. So there, th- this this complexity needs to be unpacked because on strategic level we're in um, in one di- going in one direction, but then when you think what's feasible for these different smaller countries and their because of their dependency, that becomes uh, that becomes uh, to say at least more interesting. I know we need to wrap up soon, but I was going to ask you one quick question uh, about the domestic political matter, which is the upcoming election. Uh, I think we all have been through Poland at various points of, uh, in, our, in our lives, sort of see how how, how bitterly divided the, the, the country feels at the moment and how, how polarized it is in ways that are very recognizable to, to Americans in particular. And uh, how how fearful should we be about uh, the election sort of setting in motion a sort of cycle of, of, of really sort of even more bitter and adversarial politics that would seek to delegitimize institutions, claim that, you know, the elections weren't fair and free and, and, and so on and so forth in a way that could distract Poland and its leadership from its international role, particularly in the war in Ukraine. I think we all feel that we need a strong and vocal and active Poland on the European, on the global stage right now. Uh, are we going to have it, you know, six months from now? Um, I, I have good news uh, to you if you're worried about polarization. Uh, with this election, polarization is likely to d- diminish in one of two ways. Either PIS wins and Poland uh, will transform uh, with the level of in- investment into a in military into something of a new Turkey. So basically the voices of dissent will be diminished to the degree that they will not be so relevant. Uh, Poland will, will move away from democracy uh, at, at a closer speed because uh, the government will exploit the moment for building up uh, their own model of um, that will start to very quickly resemble all these autocratic tendencies with a high rising corruption we already have um, have seen and, and exploiting the moment for their own private benefits. Um, so it's uh, that that's that's what's really at stake with these elections. The uh, the opposition um, is if it is uh, winning, which currently doesn't seem so. You know, given I mean, if you if you as attribute some percentage points this is this is less likely than uh, than you would probably i would probably hope i'm voting for the opposition here um the their um their idea is actually to restore procedures and impartiality in an essentially good governance which will mean of course that certain people will have um the prosecutor's office on their necks but overall, this is not going to deepen the polarization in, in the country because it's not about delegitimizing uh, the opponent's claims on you know religious beliefs or, I don't know, conservative standing. But it is about restoring the, the, the fair game in, uh, in, 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 in politics. And I do believe that should PIS be losing, uh, there are just enough of people there in this camp who, let's say, are pragmatic um, or technocratic, and they would understand uh, that their best chances is not to be associated uh, uh, with, with the government, we, which we have seen uh, oftentimes when autocrats were fa- failing, that the circles around them were uh, jumping the ship early on to save their skin and also to tell um, you know uh, things that were in the in the public interest to reveal the malpractices and heal the situation, soothen the situation. In Poland, currently, we do not have this type of uh, 
insurgency, uh, militia groups uh, at the level that would be threatening uh, to, and, and you know, that you could imagine the violence. We had incidents of political, um, politically motivated violence, including killing of mayor of Gdansk. Um, however, there is in the society, and again, remember what we started discussing uh, in, the, in the beginning, in the society, there isn't a moment of, of a deep polarization. People are welcoming. These were voters of all parties who were welcoming refugees. There is there is a sense of we're doing it, we're in it together. So that's I will, uh, so, so polls are not as polarized among themselves as much as about politics, and we are also having a very old political class. The same guys, Mr. Kaczynski and Tusk are with us for 30 years since 1989. And probably it's also time, maybe, you know, if opposition comes uh, to this conclusion, they will put forward another uh, political leader because people are also expecting there will be some someone else. And if there isn't, people are looking for different alternative solutions. The danger, that's my last point, for Polish politics, that amongst this political polarization or partisan polarization that we're observing on a politi- in the political class, the third guy who, um, who comes into the picture is anti-Ukrainian, which already in the Polish context means pro-Russian. We cannot have an openly pro-Russian party that wins uh, support. Confederacja, uh, confederation, um, right-wing, extreme right, libertarian ideas, on the margins, let's say, but but not. I mean, they are actually less affairs in in the um, in their uh, mindset uh, of of not taking any responsibility. That's maybe not, they're anarchists. Okay, let's call them anarchists, uh, where they want, uh, but uh, with the nationalist banners. Um, anarchists of of that sort are are rather dangerous, and they're sedimenting in the. In the opinion polls, uh, the danger is that they would win some uh, points and and be present for longer time and build build from that uh, for the future. But yeah, that's uh, that that is also a dark outlook uh, because they would be a meaningful uh, force uh, to, in, in, and without which probably new governments wouldn't be possible. I still think this is a relatively sunny outlook for the Eastern Front. By our standards, uh, certainly, despite the. <laughs> That's right. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Front podcast dedicated to security challenges that have erupted along the line from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. You can find more episodes, additional content on our website, ai.org, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Do get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag Eastern Front Pod, written as one word. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter through the link included in the show notes to receive more content from the Eastern Front. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Thank you, and goodbye.